Present. Yes. So move to excuse for personal reasons. Support. Uh, yes, I had one, Mr. President. Regarding Miller. Oh, no. Yes. 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 Let's see. We move seven and eight. We move for how long, sir? Okay, thank you. So moved. Oh, okay. that's right, I'm sorry. Council President, where are you placing the new item? Somebody's not speaking in their microphone. Oh. Down here. You are now. Yes. 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 Yes.
I did not get a response for 1536 North Telegraph that's operating without any permits. Need a response either from um, from the mayor or planning or the city attorney. Uh, there are no electrical, but there's no plumbing, and these people have a, a nasty disposition and attitude towards the uh, the other business near them. That that um, excuse me, Mr. President, they said that uh, they already don't pay the city to do what they're doing. <laughs> Thank you. President, members of council, the, the address following the meeting last time was referred to uh, the building department. Yes. Uh, who, I, who I believe is looking into it, but I don't have anything further than I know that it was referred to the proper people to look into the allegation. Okay, it's only been a week, but it's 1536 North Telegraph. Yeah, we made note of it, and it's uh, to the, the building and safety department. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So when council uh, had their parliamentarian uh, present uh, and you and council revised their um, rules, you inserted the provision that during public comment, speakers shall not expressly advocate a vote for or against a candidate or ballot issue. This is pursuant to Section 57 of the Michigan Campaign Finance Act. Okay, on public comments, uh, there are seven, eight, nine. There are nine. Uh, up would be Mr. Quincy Stewart. I mean uh, that you can't make a comment in favor of a candidate, or does that have to do with just an, an issue that's on, on the ballot? A candidate. Okay. All right. First, I would like to publicly thank Councilperson. Or, excuse me, I'm sorry, or ballot issue. Or, 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 or so ballot nothing issue. about a candidate or a ballot issue? Ballot issue. So in my speech, I can't mention a candidate. Is that what you're saying? Or ballot issue. Can't even mention their name. Now, you can mention their name, but you can't say you support your uh, got you. or against. Got you. All right. I got it. I got it. First, I would like to publicly thank Councilman, Councilperson Waterman, Waterman for her assistance over the years. I can't think of anything I've ever asked her to do within reason that she's not tried to do. On another note, it's good to be back in the saddle again at this roster to ensure accountability and advocacy for the citizens of Pinec, especially those of us in District 1. I've not been twiddling my thumbs in anxious anticipation to come back to these proceedings just to run off at the mouth. In my area, we have established an active, politically astute and hands-on block club, which we have aptly named the Crestwood Asterwood Block Club for self-determination. We are an autonomous body with no connections to any one political party, candidate, nor ideology. We don't need nor will we seek permission, blessings from nor city council or the mayor, unless we see fit for only those activities which need that kind of contact with government. We understand early on that certain kinds of city leaders who are inescapably ego-driven and narcissistic, control freaks and micromanagers seek to extend their locust of control to everyone and everything else they see. These are what I call mini dictators, Trumpian wannabes and blackface who may not have the best interests of the citizens at heart. As a body, we only seek to better the quality of life of those who dwell within our small but important electorate. We're looking at food co-ops in our black club, 
in the future, as well as some grant writing to pull those needed resources for the health, well-being, and yes, safety of our residents. We've been meeting and carried, have carried out some preliminary activities with, the good, with good results, such as a neighborhood cleanup on May the 8th and established a neighborhood newsletter. I must say in full disclosure that, uh, well, I, I won't go there because that's mentioning a candidate. Um, let's see, so let me go right down here. Um, all right, so anyway, uh, I will reserve any more comments to the next few weeks and I hope to give a balanced view of this particularly important election. As usual, I will never just limit my comments to the parochial issues facing us just here in Pontiac. We do not live in a vacuum. What happens in the nation and indeed the world affects us right here in this little speck on the world atlas we call home here in Pontiac. Mr. Robert Bass. Good evening, everyone. My name is Robert Bass, and uh, I stopped by this evening just to pretty much give thanks to all of those people that showed up at our candidate's forum on the 11th at uh, Lynx of uh, Crystal Lake. And I want to thank uh, Mr. Kermit Williams for stepping in and being our moderator. Did a very proficient job, as well as our uh, committee. When I say proficient, they, everything went very well, in my opinion. Uh, Claudia Buckley, uh, Dubri Newman, Mel, Mel Kaya Newman, Irene Wright, uh, Laurie Bishop, Mr. Bishop, staff, and the staff at Crystal Lake. I want to thank all of those people for putting together a very, very enjoyable evening at, at the uh, forum. I want to thank all those that participated in the forum. However, I have two other issues I hope that I have time to address. And that's the economic director that y'all uh, referred me to, to get the rest of my answers from the questions that was asked last week about the CDC. Number one, don't ever come at me about the people that live in Pontiac and say that you only want astute people on your committee. And there's nobody astute here enough to be on your committee. And all the parameters that you mentioned in the meeting were wrong. When you, when you say that uh, your committee, which is only uh, uh, initiated with people that were very astute, that committee and city council cannot take the place of uh, community uh, participation. But they're so astute, they should know that. I guess they do know that, but at any rate, that's what I was hit with and, and blown off on what y'all sent me to ask about. I was not important enough or astute enough to get a, a conversation, not even two minutes. I asked for two minutes, couldn't get that. Walked off, said, I'll call you tomorrow. I didn't get a call until fr thir Friday of which I was not going to take. If I wasn't astute enough to sit here and talk to you, then I'm not astute enough to answer my phone to your phone call. Now, number two, would you honor me one minute, please? This one. Another thing is I was threatened by the mayor. I don't take threats from anybody. You threaten the CDC or you threaten me personally, to shut me down or bring me out publicly, do it. I'll stand up to anything you put before me. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Bass. Next for public speaking, number three would be H. H. Bill Maxey. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. Pontiac and governance. My name is H. Bill Maxey. I am a tax and business owner in this city. I have two issues, one with DPW and one with code enforcement. 
on Berwick Street at Orchard Lake, there's a building that has been abandoned. The tree limbs and the glass and the paperwork around that building on the corner has not been taken care of in a year. I went to code enforcement. I was told that this gentleman that owned the property has several violations and had not adhered. Secondly, it's 869 across from the mill dam. There is, in that area, trees have been removed, the soil has been violated, environmental code. The owner did not see or act as that inspection be done. In the rear of that building is a five foot drop off. A car could be placed there, a bus, or any little kid wondering could be placed behind that building. I can't understand why DPW and the agency, agency hadn't got a hold of this. Last week, I went to the Department of Public Work and asked that we have a seminar, not a seminar, pardon me, a round table for contractors in this city, noting that there was one African-American contractor. I asked for emergency clause. Could that be a hell harmless with all the tall grass and dirt that's on our streets in this beautiful city? You mean to tell me you can't have emergency contractors and a hell harmless clause? You understand I see outsiders cutting grass some areas in our city. So I was told by DPW two weeks ago, you can have a meeting on the 26th. You mean I have to wait four weeks, five weeks before, before I have, hold a round table? We have eligible and qualified contractors in this city. And I have to wait. Madam Mayor, I would like for you to talk with them and demand that they give myself and other contractors that audience. It's not acceptable for one contractor from this city. Emergency contractors are needed. That's why grass is high, mosquitoes in the grass, and what, whatever other is in that grass. And I think you should honor our contractors, and I think you should not honor me, but listen to the problem that I have. Oh, by the way, the fence over on uh, uh, Berg and Elizabeth Lake Road was a mess fence. The owner had about 12 violations. He put up a fence that a six-year-old could take down. I would like to see a steel fence. I would like to see that. That property is still under tenant and it's abandoned. Something should be done. I'm from District 1. I love my community. I live there. And I really need I'm to meet your community relations director in the next week to see if we can have that meeting. Thank you, Thank Mr. Maxey. Uh, next up, number 4B, Kenny Anderson. Good evening and the struggle for black democratic human rights to continue. The topic of my address this evening, over the past year, COVID-19 and the black community. It's been over 15 months since I've addressed the black community regarding our cycle, social and economic issues. Over the past 15 months of the COVID-19 pandemic has been devastating to us. We've been super disproportionately affected by the virus. We've suffered more sickness and deaths Yes, COVID-19 killed too many of our nanas and my dears, too many of our grandfathers and grandpas, too many of our mothers and fathers, too many of our sisters and brothers, too many of our aunties and aunts, too many of our nieces and nephews, and too many of our cousins and friends. With all of those unfortunate deaths, COVID-19 exploited and exposed how we are as a black people. Think tremendously from chronic diseases. We've been massively sick from heart disease, strokes, diabetes, kidney failures, hypertension, cancer, obesity, et cetera. So black folks, what are we going to do about our terrible health status? Since this is election season, politicians will be talking about vote for me. Others are saying, get out and vote. Let me say this, as black folks, we got civil rights and voting rights. Why ain't we push for our rights to be healthy? What does voting really mean when we have all the sicknesses and deaths. What would Dr. King say about our terrible health status today, 56 years after the initial Voting Rights Act? What would Dr. King say about our terrible health status when we've elected hundreds of thousands of black politicians? 
King would say, this is totally unacceptable. King would say, this is an extreme emergency and we must act with an urgency. Before I close out, I wanna highlight a major cause producing factor that adversely impacts blacks. This adverse factor is sitting during COVID-19 pandemic. We were socially isolated. Many of us were sitting at home, sitting all the time, sitting too much. Prior to COVID-19, black folks sat way too much anyway. Current statistics show that blacks lead the nation in television viewing, sitting and watching TV. Mayo Clinic, Dr. James Levine says, sitting is more dangerous than smoking, kills more people than HIV, and is more treacherous than parachuting. We are sitting ourselves to death. Sitting increases chronic diseases, muscle degener degeneration. Black folks, we need a health revolution. We must take a stand and move to improve our health and save our lives. The struggle continues. Thank you, sir. I think it's, is it, is it Julian M? Okay, okay. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Hello, honorable body and mayor. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak before you. Uh, I want to stay, uh, first of all, um, I want to thank um, Council President for um, emceeing the event that I was able to participate in on Sunday regarding candidates running for the district. Um, the CDC, thank you for the opportunity, everyone that was involved in that, Mr. Bass and Ms. Bishop. Uh, I wanted to share some information pertaining to the Oakland County Water Resource Commissioner's Office. We have implemented a program, uh, it's called Pay Near pay near me, where you can pay your water bill at 7-Eleven, CVS Pharmacy, and the Family Dollar Store. We are also working with Walmart, and that will be on, um, on board with us to make it easier for citizens to pay their bill. You can pay with cash when you go in. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that we have the RAP program it's the Water Residential Assistance Program for those who may not know. Um, you can receive up to $1,000 in assistance for your household. Um, there's $25 uh, monthly bill credit to help those with arrearages and up to $350 in arrear payments made at initial enrollment. There is an income eligibility uh, guidelines that you must meet. A lot of this information you can find at our website, www.ogov.com backslash water. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next will be number six, be Mr. Chuck Johnson. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Chuck Johnson here. It's again a pleasure uh, after a year or so that I haven't been in front of the council, full council, and it's a pleasure just to see each of your faces and still in good health. Uh, I, I'm gonna look forward to seeing you along the way. And to the ladies and gentlemen here in the audience and those of you at home watching my television, I guess my mug shot might be a little bit different here this evening because it was different last Friday when I got thrown into jail for no good reason, but we'll deal with that later. <laughs> My reason for being here this evening is uh, two articles, uh, two items. Ten it was really, two you took off the chair, but 10, 11 and 12. Just goes back to what Maxie has been preaching about for years in and months and months in. And these guys do not need or shouldn't be awarded any of these contracts. Because if you go back and look at what they are doing in our city as business people, look at their properties, look at how they're breaking our rules and regulations. They're not in compliance in any way. They're not offering any opportunities to our local contractors, to our local individuals, whether you might be just a common labor. They're not trying to bring any dollars back to our city. I'm looking at these two contracts here 
and I can see almost $250,000 that won't hit this city. None at all. Because these guys don't care. And as long as we continue giving these jobs to these individuals, we're not going to see any advancement for our young folk in this community. Uh, I know I had a, a, some other items that I wanted to speak about this evening, but most importantly, I wanted to be, come here again and see Patricia's smiling face, even though I can only see a part of it, and the rest of you council people, and, and of course you, Mayor. <clears throat> uh, I'm hopeful that uh, everything that we start doing in the coming months and years, uh, that it's going to be a benefit to the citizens of this community. Uh, we have been left out for so long, and we need uh, a good administration and a good government so we can move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, next up will be Mr. Charles Blackwell. Hello, my name is Charles Blackwell. I would like to sadly congratulate Garland Doyle for getting the city of Pontiac sued yesterday in circuit court for failing to respond to my Freedom of Information Act. So the city of Pontiac can congratulate Garland Doyle for that. Secondly, I would like to state about Mayor Waterman and Finance Director Darren Carrington rigged hiring practices. Darren Carrington used to work at the city of Inkster as a treasurer, and there was a city clerk who worked there by the name of Felicia Rutledge. Darren Carrington hired this employee without the employee even filing a job application. Imagine an employee working for the city of Pontiac getting an $80,000 a year salary and doesn't even have to fill out a job application because they are friends with the finance director who works here. The job application that she filled out didn't even list how she qualified for the job. I mean, imagine getting a job and you don't have to fill out a job application, and when you do have to fill out one, you don't have to say how you're qualified for it. And so that shows that in the city of Pontiac, that you can work here, not because you're qualified, but because you're friends with people who work here. Thank you. Thank you very much. The, uh, the last person for public comment will be Ms. Melanie Ruffin. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Melanie Rutherford. I stay in... Um, District one. There's no such thing that a vote doesn't matter. It all matters. That was said by Barack Obama. The current population of Pontiac is 57,832 people. We are the 27th, the 20th largest city in the state of Michigan, and we are the 658th um, largest city in the United States. There is 50% of blacks, 37.94 of whites. And there were 16,373 ballots that was cast in 2018. That means that only 37% of us actually voted. The reason why this is important is because August the 3rd, everything is about to change in our community. And so I'm employing us as a community to vote. Just making posts on Facebook will not get it done. Just complaining on the sideline will not get it done. If we truly want to see change in our community, we have to vote. We have to vote for the greater good of our students. We have to vote for the greater good of our children. We have to vote for the greater good of our seniors, but we have to vote. At the end of the day, you are voiceless if you do not cast your ballot. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. President, end of public comments.
there you go. It was directed to all council members, and this is something that we dealt with during the budget session. I thought this would be something that we could still before we discuss here today. Because it gave me pause when I saw um, that we had put in our budget to bring on eight new deputies, and then uh, we did cut uh, the overtime budget. There was procedures here in case you say because of the cuts in the overtime budget that they were going to not adhere to the eight offices that we had placed in the budget. So um, that gave me some great pause. So I just felt that this was something that this honorable body needs to talk with him about. If we have to amend our budget, I think that's something that we should do. One of the things that I did, I, I looked into at the rate to do overtime. And um, last year, we gave the sheriff's department $1.2 million that I just from the sheriff. I like to know where that money went and how that money was spent. Um, also, if we were to bring all our would that not help increase the overtime usage and custody time for those officers? And um, also, I just would wait to evict that I know is in the city and place it, you can help me with this, but Pastor Joey, this is James Street, is this a greater? They paid for all the overtime that was for the sheriff, for the police, for the uh, uh, star emergency team, for, uh, and they also took down a security bond to DPW to clean up. So I need to know when that went away and why is the city having to dump all this overtime for these special events that come to the city. And what is this city getting out of these special events that come here? So that's why I wanted to bring this to the table. And that might be something that we should sit down um, as uh, subcommittees and discuss and, and get some insight on this. Because as I stated before, that gave me some problems. That gave me some great concerns. And we worked very hard to try to accommodate the sheriff's department by bringing these extra sheriffs on here to get the fella now because we might have uh, uh, decreased the overtime and we can't get the sheriff that we need. So that's what I have to say. I don't know if how my colleagues might feel about it, but I have to say that we need to discuss their actions and budget amendment as it relates to that. Mr. President. Oh, yeah. Keep calling on me. We don't have any time. I don't have too much to say right at this point, except what Patrice just said. If we are having special events and, and they're not paying any bond and they're not offering to pay anything towards all the emergency services we're using, I, I think we should certainly be looking into that because that might indeed cut down on some of the overtime costs. I believe the overtime that they're, that we're talking about in the budget is for when the officers are having to come to the courts. They work overtime because they have to get the reports done as the captain listed in the email. And you can't just walk away when there is a report that needs to be finished your shift may end at 11 o'clock, but your report may not be done until one o'clock because you're still wrapping up. You can't just say, I'm gone and let somebody else come in that doesn't know that. I have said this for years and I say it because of experience. I rode with the deputies for six solid years, um, once a week, if not twice a week. And I see what they go through and I did it for an educational purpose. Because when you have a crime, when you have a child that's assaulted, 
and you have to bring this child down to Southfield. You can't just, my shift is over with, I'm sorry, you gotta wait for the next deputy to drive from Pontiac down here to get the rest of your report. Please remember what happened. That doesn't happen. They have to finish these up. When there is a murder, they have to finish it up. They need to talk to those witnesses. They need the deputy that talks to the witnesses. The deputy that is there is the deputy that responds in the courthouse. It's not another deputy. They may not be working the day of the court date, but they still have to come in. And that's where the overtime comes in from. And I'm gonna say Mr. Bosnick is here. He is also one of our prosecutors and he can share his thoughts on that when we're talking about the overtime, how many hours these guys come into the courts and how many hours they spend on their own free will to come in to testify. Thank you. Um, most of you know, I, for the last month or so, I've been advocating, and I'm just gonna put it out there. Uh, I don't see any police here, that much. And I'll be out in my district a lot. My residence tells me that it feels like there's no one here anymore. Uh, I sit on Martin Luther King all the time, my family on the street, and I see people running up down Martin Luther King doing 90, 100 miles an hour all day long, all day. I don't know about the rest of you, but I keep, I, I tell everybody, I work for the people. That's who I work for. When I start working for myself, I'll be on the other side. And they tell me, and I know, I'm out there. And that's why I advocated for more police officers because we need community policing. We need police in the neighborhood, like I'm in the neighborhood. Only thing I don't have authority to do what I need to do while I'm in there. And so it was very important to have those officers. Definitely we need them from uh, traffic patrol. But right now, the neighborhoods are in, if you're out there and you live in the like, you know what I'm talking about for TV land out there. You know what I'm talking about because you talk to me. And I understand that they have to go to the courthouse, but I just got one question, and I don't know if any of my colleagues can answer. Do we currently have any officers doing community policing right now? Yes, we have two of them. We have um, Sam James is, I think Sam James is also your community officer, and there, but, but you gotta return the calls when they call. That's a lot of the problem that we have. And Gil Garrett is the other community officer. I don't know all of the sh all of the districts that Gil has, but I know I have Sam, and I know that he says that he's also assigned to you. I know Gil is in District One and Seven. I'm not sure if Randy has Sam or if he has Gil, and uh, Megan has Gil. So well, I, I, we I do just, have two. I'm, I'm not trying to call anyone out. I, I'm just I'm just speaking facts. I'm just giving you and the answer. The fact answers, is, sir. we need these officers. Every year, our budget with the fire and the police is three quarter of the budget for the city. And it's going up and up and up, but we're not getting anything for it. I think what we need more is the traffic officers. We're not getting anything for it. And so, right, and I'm, going, I'm just gonna say this. I'm just gonna say this. We need those officers. Uh, I believe that we need to have them, even with Mr. Bouchard, Mr. Waterman. We need, to, we need to talk to Mr. Bouchard and see what's going on. Because we, I, I don't know about you, but I'm being held accountable for the police officer right now. It's, it's a lot going on in this city that we need help. And I sit down and I just watch. And I don't have nothing else to do because I do just watch. And it is bad in these neighborhoods. Name it is going on. And people feel so free to do what they want because guess what? Nothing's going to happen to them. We can give giving more money, but we're not getting a lot of service. That's my situation. That's my problem with it. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I have a problem with the uh, with the overtime. Also, I have a, a large problem with the uh, with the budget, and I think we need to have a forensic audit getting beyond that. And anything over ten thousand dollars needs to come in front of this council to be approved as an amendment to the budget. hear me now? Uh, I, I have the same problem uh, that everyone else is having. Um, uh, over where I live, um, 
fortunately and thankful that we don't have a lot of um, things going on, but we do have some things going on. And uh, I, I have, I don't see any police driving through there or passing by or, or anything. And especially, I'm right across the street from the park, and everybody is coming over to that park now. Um, and, and whether they, I, and it is my idea that they're not going to the proper channels that we're supposed to go to. They just decide that they're going to party and they come over there in the park, and it, it gets scary sometimes. And um, so uh, I feel that this is something that we need to look into so that we can um, do what we need to do for the citizens that's paying their taxes to be up here. Thank you.
Mr. Chair, I don't know if you would see me. I'd ask you to recognize this because the subject with all these barriers to you. I didn't know if you could see that I had my ask to be recognized on the subject. Thank you. And I am glad, uh, so glad, uh, Congressman Waterman, that you brought this subject back to the table because I too um, pointed out that letter that was sent to us from Captain Ewing. Um, the, they had asked originally for an additional DPU unit. Uh, we gave more officers, but the officers uh, were several traffic officers, and they don't do the level of the kind of community policing that we need. So I like the fact that you're going to reconsider that now and maybe do a budget amendment, because what we need is more deputies uh, who can act at that level. I agree. Uh, we want our more community policing. We want more officers on the streets who are watching. Uh, we, uh, we, they brought the crime level down in the city. That's good. The response time is a lot faster. But I think also having officers on the street, on the beat, in the community, is also a deterrent to crime and make us all feel uh, better. In addition, uh, the money that we have for that, uh, the, the a contract that we have, the budget that you pass serves as the basis for the contract that uh, we will negotiate with the sheriff. But in addition to that, many of you heard me talk about the Biden bucks, the American Rescue Plan money. Also, as we made uh, suggestions about what council might consider for that $37.7 million that's coming to the city of Pontiac, the use of that can be for additional public safety. So as we talk about how we're gonna use that and we're gonna have those conversations, I know council's interested and how we expend those funds for the things that are priorities for our citizens is one of them to keep them safe and public safety and having additional officers is one of the things that we can pay for with the Biden bucks. Thank you. Mr. President, I heard you say that we, we need traffic officers, and yes, we do. 
But the one thing is, is there's three traffic officers that he has asked for. There's not eight officers that we gave them. So if we cut back the other five officers, we still have three additional traffic officers, which will give us four traffic officers, which will bring in more money. Yes, we don't have so many community policing officers. However, crime has gone up. And if you look at the police reports that I give you every single month on DB stats, on the, off the arrest and the weapons that they have brought in, as well as the drugs they have brought in, and that is not with NET, that is just with our own officers out of our substation. That is the problem, and that is one of the reasons why we have more overtime costs. So when we get these people that are acting inappropriately, which is causing the crime, maybe then our overtime costs can come down. I have two. Uh, uh, one is for Ken. I just retrieved some text that, uh, that somebody's requesting they might check from each individual. It appears the levels are not consistent. Ken. Ken? Mark. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, second thing was, uh, Mr. President, um, uh, I, have a, I have an issue with, not just on the overtime, but, uh, but failure of the city to notify the residents on the construction that's going on Walton Boulevard. None of the residents or the business have been notified on how long the construction was gonna take. There are failures of business that are going on on Walton Boulevard at while the construction is going on. Also, since it's a workplace, there should be somebody or something posted that the fee limit is, is 35 or less. And the semi trucks and everything are flying through Walton Boulevard. It's a place that should have been notified, the police should have been there or somebody should have been there uh, handling that, that, that traffic control on Walton Boulevard between Waterford and uh, Joslin. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, we have summer program going on, uh, and uh, one of the things we just had at uh, 825 Golf Drive was a piston basketball camp, which uh, we had an overflow of children who were there. We had pistons ownership who came and directed that camp, and it was very popular amongst the children. So we're happy to use that gymnasium. Uh, for the summer programming, uh, we are doing a variety of spots around the city, and we have what we call pop-up uh, locations. So that we know that one of the things is when we used to have four centers, it used to be accessible to more children and the community. So we are now uh, have developed a number of pop-up spots. Uh, we are negotiating with them to start that programming, uh, including a greatness camp at uh, Trinity Church, including New Bethel Church. We're going to have all day activities certain days a week, and then as well as new uh, international church. The uh, A25 Golf Drive, luckily, even though the council uh, and their wisdom decided to hold that uh, $2.5 million rather than purchasing that site, uh, rather than getting evicted July 1st, we were lucky that we have a donor who has uh, made it possible that we could also stay in that site long enough to make a successful transition for our children, many of whom are coming activity. So I'll have the attorney speak to that, you know, in terms of whether in kind or not. Um, as, uh, Mr. Gibb, you can speak to that. Yeah. 
Right. Council President, members of council, the, uh, the relationship is between a private donor directly with Dr. Byerly. Dr. Byerly issued uh, legal notification to the city of his intent to uh, preserve his rights under the ongoing lease agreement, but without imposing the penalties that we discussed um, two meetings ago. So we're relying on that communication from him and working, as we indicated two weeks ago, to transition the programming. As we indicated, it's a, a large task so that we um, continue. We also have contracts for a lot of that programming. So we're doing that work. Uh, we're in a very solid legal position regarding 825 Gulf Drive. Economic development is also working with Dr. Byerly's corporation um, on the potential uh, redevelopment of that with a private uh, firm. They are also looking at the city to participate in a way that can keep the children's programming going, and all of that is uh, in process. But the city attorney, Attorney Chubb and myself, uh, now Attorney Bostic, have worked very closely to make sure that the city's protected. There is no impact um, regarding uh, any of the insurance or the liabilities. The policies of the city uh, remain intact, uh, just as any other programming uh, would, would be, whether it's there or anywhere else throughout the city. I know what I'm hearing, but I'm trying to understand, even if there isn't a financial implication on behalf of the city, this obviously was a new contract, right? So even if the financial application isn't there, the contract was new term because the old one expired. And how is it that council doesn't have to approve any contracts as it relates to the youth rec program? Because that's an incorrect legal analysis. It's not a new contract. How it's is it not? How's it not? I didn't interrupt you. Go ahead. Uh, it, it's, it's not a new contract, and that's an incorrect legal analysis in, in resident or in, in landlord tenant, commercial landlord tenant law. What's happened is the property owner, the landlord, has provided legal notice to the city that we are technically a holdover tenant under the original contract. It's what we described and discussed over two meetings. That landlord has been courteous enough to preserve his rights under the lease, but waive any of the additional penalties. So that contract continues with the city as a holdover tenant at the property. All the remaining obligations remain the same. Our responsibility to provide insurance to staff and for programming activities continues, whether it's there, whether it's at Trinity Church, or whether it's here at the Bowen Center. All of that continues. So there's not a new contract. This is a continuation as a holdover tenant at the property as is permissible under Michigan law. So the attorneys have made sure that there's been no additional exposure, that our liabilities have not been changed in any way. Uh, regarding the city's insurance exposure or otherwise. And we're right now in a holdover status. This is something that I advised the council was likely to happen. We've been able to take advantage of a donor working directly with Dr. Byerly and good legal counsel to make sure that we're not exposed any further. So, the very nature of the fact that the pay or change is going to alter the terms of the contract. So even if you're saying to me that someone else is paying, the city in terms of the contract obligation is not the responsible party for paying them. Somebody else is paying it. No, no, we, re we remain responsible for the entire lease agreement. So now quite we're frankly, responsible for the whole of it. But yet, so we're not paying that. that. We're council not paying that on agreement of the landlord. We have no control over what he wants to offer, only to take oh, advantage no. of him illegally. What he's willing to no, waive no. or accept under the under the leasehold contract with the property is what he's willing to waive or accept. Okay. So we remain liable, but we've been able to negotiate ourselves into a position that we're transitioning program to churches. We met today with. With the schools, excuse uh, me, excuse, excuse me, Mr. All, Mr. Gibbs. all the things that you've asked hold for. Hold on, hold on, Mr. Gibbs. I just want to as quickly as we can. I just want to stay because this program is to August 26th uh, via the flyer. So I just want to put that in perspective before you start shifting to talking about uh, moving to churches and other things. The question is this: Almost three weeks ago, you guys asked the council to approve a lease extension for Golf Drive. That lease extension did not get approved, yet right. still you guys are still operating out of golf drive. The city council has seen no documents in order to con continue those services. And so if it's pop up outside, whatever it is, we pay those damages, or will we have a special closed session meeting to deal with how we pay for injuries assessed at golf drive? The insurance coverage is on the property, including Dr. Byerly's, uh, would continue. And that would be a question of the, the property liability insurance that he's carrying both as a landlord and our general 
insurance as a city. So how can our general insurance be used at a building that is not approved by the council? Because the, the council de facto did approve this because we are a holdover tenant at the property. Now listen, <laughs> now listen, I'm not, listen, I'm not trying to be argumentative, I'm just saying the legal facts of it. The, the, there was no possible way to completely vacate the premises. The landlord has offered to, to not waive his rights in the lease, but to extend our status as a holdover. We're a holdover tenant at the so, property. So, the lease so, was approved, and that's the status. Mr. Of Gibbs, I'm going to turn this over to my colleagues. I'm just trying to get this to make sure I understand. So you're telling me the city of Pontiac is a month-to-month -month tenant right now? Wow. That's what a holdover is, right? Yeah. You, you, yeah. You, you're a month-to-month -month tenant, right? Until we vacate or and, until he files summary proceedings and, to a and, and so the, the question is this. If the city has agreed to take on damages and responsibilities in a building that the contract expired and was not reapproved by the city council, how do you as administration have the ability to continue or enter in any contracts that have not been approved by the city council? When the lease is up, they give you an offer. They say, do you want to renew your lease or do you want to go to month to month? By agreeing to go to month to month, that is a new form of contract. I'm just trying to figure out, and maybe it works different in commercial real estate. Right. I'm just trying to figure out how a government body with the city of Pontiac logo on a flyer to August 26 does that without any council approval. We didn't agree to a new contract, and we didn't agree to go month to month. What we indicated was that the city of Pontiac was not vacating the premises because of the challenges that were described over the last uh, really? three council meetings. Uh, attorney so, Sharp and then council so right. at that status, the contract continues. And so I just want this council to be mindful of the fact that it's public record with the video that council expressed the fact that the city was going to have to vacate the premises. So council did not give the approval to be a holdover tenant. That information is public. So God help us if something happens because it is public. Yeah. Council did not make that decision to continue to be a holdover tenant. And, and I agree with that. The practical fact is the city attorney, I do agree with that, but the city attorney and I are mitigating the exposed damage to the city. As we indicated, the ability to move and move programming and contracts with the Boys and Girls and all of these other things was going to take time and it's simply taking time. So we've been able to mitigate the damages and the exposure of the city, and we're working as quickly as we can. And we would, we would love to have it go quicker, but we would moving as quickly as we can. Councilman Miller, I have to calm down, Mr. Gibbs. I'm not going to be so um, easy here, Mr. Gibbs. You are attorney. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I can't believe what you're saying to me. My, my grandchild would comprehend what you're saying. It's not true. You're operating in a building that I see a flyer. When I see them, like, I didn't wreck. What, what are you guys doing here? You're supposed to be gone. Uh, Mr. I'm calling you Chubb, but some, sometimes you're sounding like Chubb to me, Mr. Gibbs. That's not good for me. This is, this is, what if one of those kids over there get hurt tomorrow? And this body, and the first thing people are going to blame is council, council did, council don't know anything. We look in a, in a Facebook page and see programs over there when we're supposed to be gone. And then you're using the insurance of the people. This is what you call, that's why people don't believe in politicians. We have no knowledge of what you're doing in administration. That's what, that's what the residents have to understand. We handle the money, but unfortunately we handle the money, but the mayor and the administration, let's call it what it is, they're doing what they want to do. And if tomorrow's one of those kids get hurt over that at rec center, then we are going to get sued. And we're already sitting here trying to find money for police officers to, get, to take care of the city. This is unethical, unright, and I'm just calling it for what it is. And God help us if anybody get hurt over there. I would like to see the mayor explain herself out of this with you, for the residents. Mr. President. I, I can't believe this. Not 
So, so as a point of order, that's a defamatory comment, and no, <laughs> not in a hundred. I, I, I represented the city the same way, Madam Councilwoman, that I'm representing the city in this. President, Pro, Pro Tem Carter. Yep. Oh. Oh, I thought you shut it off. Sorry. <laughs> Card. Thank you, Mr. President. I mean, I've, I've, we sit here and hear it over and over again. I was going to say, and, 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 and to this honorable body, that this is uh, this is racketeering, this is trespassing, this is this is pure negligence on, on on the side of the administration. We had already given up on the gave up on this on this piece of property. This is uh, another case for another nail in the coffin to have a forensic audit because there is an exorbitant waste of money going on with, it, with on the other side. And I think we need to take this directly over to the Attorney General and, and make it known before any damage occur. Thank you. I'm sorry, Councilman Waterman. When you said that you were going to cuss and you turned off the microphone for a minute, I thought maybe you were done. I'm sorry. Um, why are if we have refused this building and we've refused to extend this contract? How is it that you think you can extend the liability on a building that we didn't approve? So who's responsible for that liability? Isn't that us? Li and we didn't approve it. The, the liability on the on the building itself remains with uh, Creative Management, Dr. Byerly's Corporation. The city has. <laughs> we didn't okay no, listen, the contract. Listen, I, listen. I, all I'm trying to do. So I've been, you know, I've been accused of things and called a racketeer for the hundredth time in this council. And all I'm trying to do is mitigate the exposure of the city on the situation. I recognize the council doesn't want the property. I recognize we have to move. I recognize all of that. What City Attorney Chubb and I are trying to do is to mitigate this to minimize whatever exposures we do have. And that includes contracts that we have, that includes contracts for programs. All of that's being managed as quickly as possible. United Wholesale is not going to be ready till the fall. We have these other, that's all we're trying to do here. So I know it's angering and I know it's frustrating. Our umbrella policy for the city doesn't change. If somebody gets hurt in that programming uh, uh, at that particular facility, then how it happens and whether it's Dr. Byerly's policy or whether it's our umbrella policy, we'll have to determine that. All I'm doing on behalf of the administration and all of you is try to mitigate and move as quickly as we possibly can. That's all I'm trying to do. Mitigation would be to vacate the premises right. when the lease was up. Yes, Attorney Sharp, and then we're going to move on. The problem I'm having with this is, first of all, in terms of I don't understand how you usurp the council's power and authority. How two attorneys can make a decision to say that they're going to do something different when the power rests with council. Aside from that, I question how many then other contracts are there that council may not have approved that it was decided upon that to mitigate the damage, they had to do something different. That's a very scary thought. And I just don't understand how this can continue to happen like this. Because it's 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 not it's not right, it's not legal, it's not 
We need to go to the Attorney General with this because if someone and some of those kids get hurt over there tomorrow, we're in trouble. And what the, it, it's just like you move in my house, I tell you to get out, you stay in, and I'll figure out how I'm going to get out. But in the meantime, you know, I don't pay you anything. This is what you call total disrespect of this body. It's total disrespect. Here we think, I know when I passed that place, I was seeing cars, but you know, I'm thinking everybody's gone. No, you're there. And you're using the, our insurance, the city insurance. This is, I, I refuse, this is too much. This is just too much. And I, I, I agree with Councilman Carter, anything over $10,000, we need to find out what's going on. We need, think how many other things is going on that we don't know anything about. This, this is unheard of. Yeah, um, Councilwoman Taylor Burks. I, I, I'm just, I don't know. I, I passed by there a couple of times, and I'm saying to myself as I'm driving, wonder why uh, do I see these people over here and the place is supposed to be cool. But I kept driving, went home, took care of it, just forgot about it. But, uh, uh, and then after I got home and sat down and started thinking, it dawned on me what was going on. And of course, I got very angry and I said some words that I usually use. And uh, because uh, this is very dangerous and we should not have to put ourselves in that kind of position because if something goes wrong with one of those kids, we are in deep trouble and we might as well just lock the doors and stay at home. So uh, I think that we should just shut it down. And, 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 and if anybody tries to open it back up and you see somebody, some kids over there, call the cops, call, call the sheriff, call anybody, um, lock them up. All right, we're going to we're going to take a 5 minute recess and return at 7:20.
One, that's one, two, about that. I got, I got my two. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Any council people, if you could please return to the podium. Any council people? Is this is. So we are going to call this meeting back, uh, resume this meeting at 7 uh, 21. Roll call, Mr. Doyle. Yes. Yes. All right, we're going to adjourn this meeting at 721. Thank you. Oh. Wow. I don't know. The attorney is here. I don't